All right, it's question show time. Your questions, my answers. As always, wherever you are, anywhere across my channel, if a question pops in your brain, just write it down on any video. I will gather them up and I will answer them here. Apologize in advance for all the noise that's going on behind me. It's springtime in Canada and all that means lawnmowers. And there's just, there's no way to, to miss in between the lawnmowers and trucks and children playing. So we're just gonna, just gonna go with it. All right, let's do the first question. Row. Are rings around a planet like Saturn only limited to gas giants? Here in the solar system, we've got rings around Saturn, Jupiter, Neptune, and Uranus, all of them. Now they're very different. So the rings around Saturn are obviously these big, beautiful um, ice rings. And while the rings in Jupiter are different, the rings in Neptune, Uranus are actually very dusty and they seem to be made of, of grit as opposed to large amounts of, of water ice. And so it looks like, it's like if you just saw the same kind of rings around all the same giant planets that you think well then giant planets will get rings but in this case the rings are different caused by different sources in some cases it's like cryovolcanism on one of the moons maybe it's caused by by asteroids grinding together and so you can expect that there may or may not have been rings around other terrestrial planets in the past Earth might have had rings in the ancient past. And so what would be the cause, right? We're too close into the sun to have anything made of ice that could last, but there could be a situation where maybe we once had a moon and the moon got too close to the earth and the Roche limit, you know, too close, got within the Roche limit where the tidal forces of the earth's gravity pulls the moon apart and, and it turns it into a ring. And then all the pieces of the ring smash into the earth's atmosphere and cause some very bad days. So if we see a ring, we that would mean we're due for a disaster. So you don't want one here on, on Earth. But, but, and in fact, this is gonna happen on, on, uh, on Mars in about 50 million years or so, right? Phobos is just getting closer and closer to Mars and in about 50 million years, it's gonna cross within the Roche limit of Mars. Mars' gra gravity is gonna tear it into a ring and then it's just gonna orbit Mars for a while and then all the pieces will just come down and smash into Mars. So uh, who knows? I mean, we just, we haven't done enough research of other planetary systems to know if ring systems are common. I can't wait for us to find out by Quittier. I wonder if we successfully block the light on Venus, how the pressure would drop as the temperature gets down and things get to liquefy. We've mentioned this in the past, that the atmosphere on Venus is so much denser than the atmosphere we have on Earth, right? At the surface of Venus, you're looking at 90 times the Earth's uh, atmospheric density, which is as bad as being a kilometer under the ocean uh, here on Earth. So it's bad, right? Crush. Uh, and so the question is, could you get rid of it? And the way you would get rid of the atmosphere on Venus is that you would put up some kind of sunshade in between the sun and Venus that would block all the radiation hitting Venus. And then Venus would just start to cool down to the background temperature of space. And over at some great period of time, I'm not sure how long it would take, it would just get cooler and cooler and cooler. And eventually it would get so cold that all of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere starts to snow, right? And then you would just get this layering of carbon dioxide snow, sort of like what the ice caps on, on Mars look like when the carbon dioxide freezes out of the atmosphere every winter on Mars. You get that, just Venus would turn white. And then you could go down and you could shovel the frozen carbon dioxide around and, and work with it that way. And then if at any point you let the sun get back into Venus, then the temperature would rise and it would turn back into a thick atmosphere. What will you do with it? If there would be some way that you could sequester that carbon, then like bind it up with other elements to make like limestone or things like that, then maybe you would stand a chance, but uh, it's, it's a tricky problem, but it's a great, it's pretty cool that you could cool down the atmosphere of Venus to the point that it would just, it would turn into snow and that atmospheric density would just be gone. Cameron Wood. So I'm currently listening to Aurora by Kim Stanley Robinson. Would a computer or quantum computer with AI be able to design the perfect arc for when humans eventually become capable of interstellar travel? And if so, how long do you think until we build sufficiently powerful AI to take on the task? To make a spacecraft, like some kind of 
intergenerational spacecraft that can make the journey from our star system to another star system, you would need really a lot of resources. And the best idea that I've heard so far is to use like an asteroid. You take a whole asteroid, something that is kilometers across, and then you build a starter base on that asteroid. And if you want, maybe spin it up or maybe don't. Um, and then over time, you know, maybe have a spinning component onto it that's going around the asteroid or whatever. And then over time, you are turning the asteroid into rocket fuel, fusion, breathable atmosphere, building materials, etc. over time. And there's been some interesting research done that you actually wouldn't need a lot of generations and you wouldn't necessarily need that big of an asteroid to, to make that transformation as you make that journey. It's like, I don't know, it's like setting sail on a, on a, on a tree and then turning it into a boat by the time you arrive at your, at your destination. So it is theoretically possible. Would a supercomputer help? Sure. I mean, a supercomputer could help do the math to figure out all of the pieces, but really we just need experience in building self-replicating robot, robots to be able to maintain themselves, being able to understand how to live and exist in a closed environment. And it's not one problem, it's a thousand problems that need to be solved one after the other until we can stand a chance. But it's not impossible. It's just super hard. So our computers will be very helpful. Rosnom. Hey, we already have planes crossing the sky all the time, right? Do they take specific paths that don't cross telescope views? And is this obstructed data negligible? It's interesting to me that with the whole Starlink controversy, everyone is really angry about these satellites that are gonna be passing through the astronomical data, and they will. They will absolutely be passing through photographs that astronomers are taking and they are going to slightly reduce the quality of that data. And they're gonna make astronomers take longer images to get more data to remove that noise or multiple images. It's going to make astronomers' lives worse. How worse? We don't know yet. That is still the question. But airplanes are the worst. <laughs> I mean, clouds are the worst and light pollution is the worst, uh, and then, but then airplanes. And, and I would say of the astrophotography that I've done, it is airplanes that are the ones that are most obnoxious because they're, they're actually fairly big. They'll pass through your field of view. You get the lights along the sides, which are these blinking lights, and then they have other lights that are along their bodies. You get sort of four lights that streak through your image, and that whole image is garbage and you have to throw it out. So I'd say airplanes are already the worst and astronomers have to deal with that. And yeah, for a lot of the big observatories, airplanes actually route around the big observatories so that they won't fly directly overhead and pollute the images that these telescopes are taking. And this is something you can't do with satellites. You can't route a satellite to a new orbit. It's on an orbit. It's going to pass over your telescope. So I'm really glad that the Starling constellation got this controversy rolling, and I hope that we can reach some kind of compromise into the future so that we can minimize the amount of damage that's caused to astronomical data while maximizing the human good of having a global internet connection. So we'll see how this all plays out. Hubert Settle. Regarding the first question, ESA did something like that. They developed Rosetta. It had some delays. Based on Rosetta, they built Mars Express. And the term Express actually points to the fact that they saved so much time by essentially using Rosetta. Mars Express was a huge success even before Rosetta did its mission. Then, with the second unit for Mars Express, they created Venus Express. And it's essentially Mars Express without a lander, but with an extra heat shield for operations close to the sun. So this was based on the question that we had last week about why, like, why don't spacecraft use a standard chassis and then bolt a bunch of science instruments on it and you could mass produce them and wouldn't that be cheaper and so what hubert is saying is exactly right that there are there are many examples where one spacecraft is really just a modification of the previous spacecraft the mars 2020 rover is a version of the curiosity rover the viking landers were sent together or are, were essentially the same design and and so they were able to you know maximize their their development and, and so I think the thing that's really going to change things over time is, and Hubert says this later on in, in, his, in his comment, that we're going to see essentially cheaper access to space. So the things with SpaceX, right, when the Falcon Heavy launches and you can get a large spacecraft for a fraction of the price of what it used to cost, then you can just go and build a big bulky spacecraft with a lot of power and a lot of resiliency, and then you can put 
your custom instruments on board. And right now, they're just like they're right at the edge. They're launching as much as they can, and they have to shave off all of the extra hardware to be able to, to fulfill their mission. And over time, as, as we get, as launches get cheaper, you're gonna see the, the reusability and essentially the price of all these missions come down. So let's see how this all turns out. Mildromedion. We might find new Earths, but what if the oxygen level, nitrogen level, and carbon dioxide level are slightly or quite significantly over what we have in Earth atmosphere? Would we not be able to breathe the air due to much larger CO2 amounts? In the past of our planet, we had a little more oxygen, and that is why animals became so large. I believe that we can have a lot of different issues before we set the human flag on another planet. We evolved in lockstep with the environment of planet Earth. The quantities of oxygen and nitrogen in the atmosphere are, are what we evolved and really all animals on Earth evolved to come into. Carbon dioxide is of course uh, one of the bad ones in that if you get carbon dioxide beyond a couple of percent, it's a killer. So we wouldn't be able to handle a planet that had large amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The oxygen and the nitrogen, you could modify those amounts, you know, beyond a certain point with an, with an, without enough oxygen, then you have trouble breathing and, you know, it's kind of like going to high altitude. Nitrogen is an, is an inert gas, so uh, you could have different amounts of nitrogen and maybe there's other inert gases that could be in the atmosphere that we could survive on. But, but essentially, the chances of us finding another atmosphere that is that is precisely what we need is seems very remote. Now it might be that life will automatically tune the atmosphere of a planet of a habitable planet to exactly the percentages of the atmosphere that we see here. That would be cool, right? But it might not. So more research is necessary, but the bottom line is is that if we don't get an atmosphere that is very similar to what we have here on Earth, we won't be able to breathe it. And that would suck, because you'd always have to be in a spacesuit, even though you were on another planet. Suresh R. Do people have solution for scenarios like emergency situations on the space station? For example, if the station were to be evacuated immediately for some imaginable reason, how quickly can they do it? Is there a Soyuz always docked for such a situation? I imagine we would need at least two to completely evacuate at a moment's notice. So one of the considerations that people who are planning the International Space Station missions always keep in mind is what is the state of the evacuation spacecraft on the station right now? And, and so you, the so you mentioned the Soyuz, and that's, that is the, that's the vehicle that launches astronauts up to the station, and it's the vehicle that allows them to evacuate again if there's a problem on the station. And there will always be enough essentially evacuation capability on the station for the astronauts to, to get off. And they can do it within just a couple of minutes. Like if, if, if it's an immediate evacuation that they need to do, the astronauts can get into their Soyuz and they can get out of there within a couple of minutes. And they practice this all the time and they practice this on Earth and they're very good at being able to, to do it. So, and when the Crew Dragon starts to fly up to the space station, then, it'll, then it will be the same thing. The Crew Dragon will serve as, as an evacuation spacecraft at the same time as carrying astronauts up to the station. Jim Becker. Fraser, what is the cost to use the Hubble telescope? Or any other major telescope for that matter? So the Hubble Space Telescope is free to use. Um, in fact, the Hubble Space Telescope allows anyone on planet Earth to be able to apply for telescope time and be able to use the Hubble Space Telescope. They don't need to be an American. Uh, they don't need to be part of the European Space Agency, the various people that contributed to it. Hubble will accept applications from anyone working in the field of astronomy at all. When you want to use the Hubble Space Telescope, you create a research proposal you write up what is the science that you're looking to do and you send that in and then the people at the Hubble Space Telescope will organize all of the future time of the telescope to slot in the research that they think makes the most sense. And if you're looking to do something really big like the Hubble Deep Field, that may chew up a lot of Hubble time. Well, you, if you've got something that's really quick, like maybe you can get your work done in 45 minutes, they're able to slot those in and they book up the Hubble Space Telescope into the future as far as they feel is necessary. And, and many other telescopes work in this exact same way. I mean, I don't know if specifically if there's any pay for play telescope, but I don't think so. I think they are all, you 
come up with the research that you're trying to do. You figure out which are the best instruments to be able to do this. You apply for time on that telescope and then over time you will get time allocated to you if the people who are run the telescope think that it's a high enough priority for to run the scope and that's how it all works out and already people are starting to line up for how we're going to want to use the James Webb Space Telescope. Phil Bridges. Professor Kipping and others on TEDx now favor that we are unique. Some years ago Sagan and Professor Cox state that we must be part of something bigger with intelligent life being out there. What's your take? So I hope at this point most of the people who have been watching my channel know my take. If you've heard me say it a lot of times. I'm definitely in the camp with uh, Professor Kipping and he did a great video recently about why we might be alone in the universe and for me it's the Fermi paradox. The Fermi paradox is just such a bizarre mind-bending thing. The universe is big and it's old and life should have evolved many times and intelligent life should be out there and yet if intelligent life was out there then we would see its impact on the universe and we don't. And, and people come up with a sort of an ad hoc answer to why they think that we won't see them because it's really far and it's really t difficult to move around and so on and, I, and, and there are really good arguments why none of those hold up over time. So, uh, and, but this is actually going to be a shameless promotion for an interview that I did on the Space Junk podcast last week where I, with Dustin Gibson from Oceanside Photo and Telescope and Tony Darnell and we had a conversation about the Fermi Paradox and sort of why I believe that, that we are either the first intelligent civilization in the observable universe or, 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 or the only one. So uh, I think it's a, it's a fascinating concept and it just, it's really so interesting to talk about and think about and, and until we find evidence of another intelligent civilization it is going to be this burning question. So I will put a link to the interview uh, and I also put a copy of it into my podcast feed so if you are subscribed to my podcast it's in there and uh, I highly recommend you listen to it because it's like an hour of me answering that question that you just said. Tickle me and I'll kill you. Here's my question, Fraser. Can astronauts just wear weights to compensate for the lower gravity on the Moon or Mars? So it, yeah, I mean, when we're in a lower gravity, right, we are experiencing less weight pulling us down. And so you can imagine that, like, just wear a weighted spacesuit. <laughs> like I said, background noises. Wear a weighted spacesuit, uh, and then your muscles and your bones would feel like you're on Mars or you're on on sort of feel like you're on Earth even though if you're on Mars or on the Moon and that's, and that's a great first step. The problem is that in lower amounts of gravity there are parts of our, you know, our internal organs, our eyes, our fluids around our body. They redistribute in different ways in lower gravity and we don't know what the impact is going to be whether you're on the Moon or whether you're on Mars over long periods of time. We just know that if you wore a weighted spacesuit it wouldn't help because it's, it's, it's in your guts. So we're going to need some kind of solution depending on how bad it is which we don't even know yet to solve the problem of redistributing fluids and problems with your eyes and stuff. And so these are, these are just on, these are going to be the challenges that we are going to face if we want to try and live in space and on the moon and on Mars. And I hope that someone is able to do the research to give us an answer because right now the best answer is we have no idea. Dominic Leather. I have a question. How much research has been done into weaponizing asteroids? We're moving closer and closer to our first asteroid capture mission. It doesn't seem like a massive technological leap to turn them into devastating tools of destruction. Could there be a day in the not too distant future when we worry about an asteroid gap? All our technology always comes in these two ways. There is the way that it helps, the hammer, right? You use a hammer to bang in nails to build houses and you use a hammer to hit a person. That everything that we invent and every technology that we develop has downsides as well, dangerous sides. And the ability to move asteroids can move them into better orbits, can, can prevent damage to the Earth in the future. There's all kinds of good reasons. And there are bad reasons, right? You could move an asteroid into a Earth-crossing trajectory and you could wipe out millions of people on Earth. That said, to be able to actually do that is going to require an enormous amount of time and patience and energy and it's the kind of thing that you would see. People would know that you were trying to do this and so if you have any assets on Earth, right, they, they take you to jail because you're trying to smash an asteroid into the Earth. 
And if you're out in space, you got a very, you know, you're going to have a fragile spacecraft that is attempting to move an asteroid. And it's going to take you 20 years. They can send a nuclear missile and blow up your asteroid mover and then send you to jail. So I think that that of the kinds of dangers that we face in the future, that one feels like it's fairly preventable. But if someone was out far enough, say out in the Kuiper Belt, and they, you know, they stealthily moved their asteroid, their comet, and 20 years later, it's on a direct trajectory to hit the Earth, there's not much we could do about it. So, you know, that's the future. Technology. HBA 97. Would it be feasible and reasonable to dig huge caverns beneath the surface of the Moon or Mars, introduce plants and algae, some CO2, nitrogen, and the necessary nutrients, have the plants produce oxygen, and slowly expand the cavern to allow more and more growth, and eventually you get an underground atmosphere? I mean, that sounds great, um, but the deeper challenge is building a closed environment. This is something that has been tried here on Earth with this concept of Biosphere 2 several years ago. They built this big greenhouse, uh, put a bunch of people and plants and animals into this closed environment and tried to not let any gases come in and come out and see how well they could do. And in the end, the CO2 levels got too high and they had to open it up and, and give up. And people have run this experiment. So, so really what we need to learn to do is to be able to create a closed environment. And if we can do that, and it's not like it's impossible, like here we are on Earth, it's a closed environment from space and it works. So we need to learn how to replicate what the Earth does for free. Thank you, Earth. So um, once we learn that, once we understand all of those inputs and outputs, then we will be able to replicate that in many different ways, whether it's going to be on in, in a lava tube on Mars or on the moon, or whether it's just going to be on a rotating space station, it will be a tremendous technological boon that we're going to be able to use wherever we go. So let's look forward to that idea. All right, we've reached the end of our question show. Uh, thank you so much for everyone who asked questions this week. I love it. Thanks to the guy mowing his lawn over there. I hope your lawn looks really nice. Uh, and I will see you all next week.